Well, good morning. Welcome to Trinity on Trinity Sunday. I'm glad you're watching us here on the virtual service today. The day we celebrate our great church, its name, and the day we talk about the Great Commission to celebrate. And we'll do that today and tonight, actually. We're going to celebrate the church's birthday at a big cookout later tonight at 6 o'clock. Hope you'll join us. But we first need to address something behind the scenes in today's passage. Normally the theme would be the action verbs, right? To go, make, baptize, teach. But today we're going to look a little deeper into the text. The unholy trinity, (laughs) as it were, of doubt and authority and fear and abandonment. A few years ago I did a funeral for a young mom of five who had taken her own life out of the blue. There was no rhyme or reason to it. Things seemed to be good on the surface, and I got the call. It's one of those calls you don't ever want to get. You walk into a situation with young children, five of them under the age of, I believe they were 14, and uh, it was horrible. And the question they kept asking was, why? What did we do wrong Their faith in Jesus turned to doubt in Jesus. They begin to question the very existence of God, which I get it. They had things like, everything was going so well. What did we do to deserve this? Does he love me? And is he ever going to leave me? If he's in charge, why did this happen? Is he here for me or is he against me? Is he angry at us? Is he punishing us? Is he even there? were the type questions I was getting. Doubt, justifiable doubt. We see it in the passage today, usually not talked about on Trinity Sunday, but it's there. Verse 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Verse 17, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You ever notice that in the scriptures? Some doubted, the honest ones doubted. Yes, these were the ones who had spent a lifetime with him, it had seemed, at least three years. They had been with him. They watched him heal. They watched him raise himself from the dead. And now they're seeing him with their own eyes, with mixed emotion and reaction. Some were worshiping. Others were doubting. One might expect all of them to be bowing down in worship. They are in a presence of the living Christ, after all. They saw the risen Lord with their own eyes, but they still weren't quite there yet. It's understandable, isn't it? I mean, this guy was dead. I mean, he was really dead. They saw his lifeless body, and now he's right there with them. It's really a crazy, too crazy to be true. It's unbelievable that a dead man could come back to life, even though they'd seen him raise dead people before. Some of them saw him raise Lazarus. Some of them saw him raise a little girl from the dead. And now they all have seen him raise himself from the dead. And yet, the core belief of Christianity is to believe this to be true, that God raised his son from the dead. I don't think this is an angry, skeptical kind of doubt that some of the disciples had. It was probably more like, all this is crazy. I can't believe this is really happening What are we missing kind of doubts? So among these disciples, there's both worshipers and uncertainty, devotion and hesitancy. And both responses are possible from the same group. Both responses are actually possible from the same person. This mixture of faith and doubt actually characterizes the Christian life, doesn't it? Have you doubted recently? What was it that brought doubt to you? Was it hurt? Is it pain or death of a loved one? Perhaps you're asking, if he's all-loving and all-powerful, then why all the evil in the world? Yes, like the first disciples, we can bring our doubt to the place where Jesus promises to meet us. And this is too, is for the discipleship. It's a part of a discipleship. It's a part of bringing us closer to himself, this doubt, and working out our faith. This is an I believe, yet help my unbelief kind of faith, isn't it? This is Jesus. I'm in because you brought me in, but I need some help believing kind of faith. And the most beautiful thing that I want you to notice 
is this. Jesus doesn't scold them for their struggle to believe. He doesn't disown them and kick them out of the family. They're still his disciples and his children, even though they doubted. Their sins are still forgiven. They're still in the family. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means God does not condemn us because of our doubt. It means, in fact, according to St. Paul in his letter to the church in Rome, for those of us who trust in Christ for our salvation, we are not condemned for anything because Jesus took the condemnation for us on the cross. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It means we can all call ourselves Christian, call on the name of Jesus alone for salvation, and still have doubt. Mother Teresa, one of the most godly women who ever walked this earth, was riddled with doubt. It's part of the Christian life. It means we can be honest with each other and with ourselves and even with God about the questions we have and the troubles that we have. We could actually bring those doubts to him and ask him to replace them with trust. And I believe that in, in time, he will bring our lack of faith to true faith. I want you to know something this morning. If you have doubt and questions, there's room for you here at this communion table. There's room for you in this church. There may not be easy answers for you, but there's room for you. Friends, doubt is always present with faith. So you're welcome here with your doubt. You're welcome to be honest. You're welcome to ask questions. But the passage continues, verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In the midst of their worship and their doubt, Jesus came to them. He came to them. Don't miss that. As always, Jesus is the active agent. We are the passive agent. And he told them, all authority has been given to me. He's in authority. We are not. Woody Allen once said, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. It's true. He's the one that's in charge. I'm not in authority over heaven and earth or even my own life. We don't exercise as much as free will as we think we do. In fact, my will is bound in countless ways. I'm powerless to myself and to my own self-interests. Things happen that I can't control. Loved ones get cancer. Young moms take their life. You surprise yourself with your behavior and desires, don't you? And yet St. Paul put it this way, I don't do the things I want to do, and yet I find myself doing the things I don't want to do. Thomas Kaminer put it this way, what the heart loves, the will chases, and the mind justifies. My natural inclination, I do not have a mastery over it. We often see ourselves as the center and the masters of the universe. That is our natural inclination. And that's problematic because I'm not. And living this way creates all sorts of destruction behavior within myself and especially for those I love. Control. I'm not in authority and I need to be rescued from myself. But Jesus is in control. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Have you noticed in our culture authority gets a bad rap sometimes? There's something in me that resists those who have authority over me. Some of that is just my arrogance and egotism. And yet, for some of us, we've been abused by authority figures. We've been hurt by them. Has someone ever in authority ever abused or abandoned you or hurt you? You see, that shapes the way that we view people in power. So here's the important question. What kind of authority does Jesus exhort? Is he an abusive authoritarian? Is he a fascist? No, not at all. Listen, he is wonderful, kind, loving, and gentle. Yes, he's mighty, and he's merciful. Yes, he's powerful, and he's full of love for you. He's tough, and he's tender. He's the transcendent creator of the universe. But he's also Emmanuel, God, with us. This loving kind of authority actually brings me comfort. If the king cares for me, even me, then that changes everything. It's an authority that reaches down to all of us 
who are beaten up and crushed and broken and bruised and says things like, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because of his authority and out of his authority, he comes to us and he gives us an invitation to receive love rather than judgment, because he took the judgment we deserve on himself, mercy rather than punishment, because again, even he deserved no punishment, he took the punishment for us. Approval rather than condemnation, there is no condemnation for those in Jesus. He gave us his righteousness in exchange for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that he might become righteous of God. His peace instead of our violence, that's all great. But perhaps you are asking, will he ever leave me? Will he get fed up with my behavior, my lack of faith, my doubt, my inability to control my actions? Will he one day walk away like everyone else does? Has someone you loved and who you thought loved you never left or abandoned you? Will Jesus leave us with some of the most comforting words ever to be given? That's what he leaves us with. He doesn't leave us. He leaves us comforting words. He says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The king will be with you till the very, very end. Friends, as we live our lives, Jesus is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not cancer, not the death of a young mom, not your boss or your enemies or your friends or your money or bankruptcy or your sin or your lack of control, not even death. He is the one who is in control. He is with you always. The one who has all authority has drawn near to us, Emmanuel, and he promises to never leave us. His promise is that I am with you always to the end of the age. How does one know in advance if this is true? The answer is that no one can know in advance. But the word made flesh keeps backing his worshipful doubters' hearts up. And it is along the way that Jesus will prove his word, his work, his presence to be true. You can count on him. Take it to the bank.